Well, thank you everybody for taking a few minutes as a captive audience to listen to us. We're uh, here from Point 72, so uh, a little bit about us. We are a private, vent, uh, of, um, private investment company. We manage the assets of our founder, Steve Cohen, who has about uh, uh, 11 billion in assets under management, his money. Our primary offices are located in Stanford, with offices in London, Hong Kong, Tokyo, New York, and Singapore. We have about 1,000 employees across the globe. So our mission is to be the industry's premier asset management firm. We want to deliver superior risk-adjusted returns and adhere to the highest ethical standards. I want to talk a little bit about some of our values, because our values actually drive how we do everything across the business, whether it's technology, accounting, the way we trade, everything we do. So ethics is integrity, our for, forefront for us. Firm first, we want to make sure that we succeed together. So what we deliver in IT and in development needs to make sure that the firm comes first. We want to be innovated, innovative. We want to strive for excellence. We're not satisfied with the status quo. We want to constantly try to make things better. As a company, we work hard to work together, and we listen to our peers. We listen to the business, and everything we do is driven to meet the business requirements in order to deliver the experience that they're expecting and the service levels that they need. And the last item, which is important to me, is that we're very community focused. So we actively participate in things in our community, uh, whether that's technology or the communities we live in. So uh, just by a quick introduction, my name is Billy Shaw. I'm the Director of Systems Engineering. I have a, a long career with Unix and Linux, starting in the Navy as a spoof, as a CT. Worked in San Francisco for a company called Organic, which if anyone's heard of the Apache web server, kind of came out of us there back in the 90s. Uh, worked for Chase Bank for a while, and I've been with Point72 since 2004. My name is Daniel Foley. Uh, I work at, uh, I'm a systems engineer for Agio. Um, I've been working with uh, Linux and Unix for seven, eight years now. Um, I have been uh, working at Agio for, or since 2013 um, on the Linux support implementation team uh, doing deployments and uh, uh, designing infrastructure um, and support as well for our client environments. Uh, since March of 2016, uh, I have been a dedicated resource for the Point72 Linux engineering team, uh, specifically also working on the OpenShift uh, enterprise deployment. So how, how do we get started with OpenShift? Uh, last February, uh, I was asked to be part of our technology steering committee, and we started discussing how we're going to change our trade aggregation and processing platform. And through that planning, we came up with a series of principles to guide us on our journey towards microservices. So we wanted to be open source first, cloud first. We wanted reactive design, CI, CD, elastic scale. Resiliency is always important to us. We always have to be up. We want everything to be secure, streaming, and distributed. And we want to build big things from small things, right? We want to have uh, test-driven development, moving code. We'll talk about each of these and, and, and what they mean to us here. So we want to use open source tools wherever possible. That's a shift from where we had been in the past. And as part of our community, we're making it a practice to also start contributing back to the open source projects that, that we use to run our business. Cloud first, we want to always look to the cloud for our platform, for our scale, for our elasticity. And we want to be reactive, right? So we want to use asynchronous messaging. We want to be able to have components that have loose coupling that we can replace things in and out of our infrastructure, our microservices, and not have a huge chain of dependencies across them. Uh, CI-CD processes are key. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But our, our uh, principle there is to automate whenever possible. So elastic scale, that's where the cloud piece comes in. We want to be able to grow and shrink based on our trade volume, based on things that are going on in the market, news that may be coming out, and be able to, to really not only manage our costs, but be able to continue our SLAs as quickly as possible when there's an event that, that causes the spikes. Uh, resiliency is pretty obvious. We, we've set up SLAs. We want to stay within them, especially as the workload increases. Um, and we want to be decoupled, very similar to to being able to keep things reactive, we want to be able to swap techno technology in and out. Uh, today, you know, we may be using one technology for streaming, and tomorrow we might, may want to be able to use another. We want to be able to be able to bring those in and out, test them, and, and bring them in with a, a full automation stack. 
And we want it to be secure. Uh, it's not optional for us, it's important to us, and we apply it to every layer of our CI CD stack. Talk about streaming. So, um, you know, we, we do a lot of processing uh, through our analysis and our experience. It's a lot easier to, to uh, treat a batch as a stream than it is to treat a stream as a batch. So that's part of our processing technique. We want everything to be distributed. Uh, that's where OpenShift came for us. It was a huge part of our selection there. We want to be big things and small things, right? So we, we do file full agile practices. We have uh, chapters so that uh, while the agile teams are cross-functional, there's a DevOps member who's familiar with both OpenShift and the CI CD. And our chapters meet weekly to discuss what the needs of each of the agile teams. And that's by building those small things, filing agile methodologies, we're able to do our frequent release cycles and we're able to provide business value very quickly at the end of each sprint. And test-driven development. So as we talk about automation and we talk about our, our uh, pipelines, we want everything to be uh, automated so that a developer who starts has to write all of his unit tests first. Uh, code will not pass the CI CD process without proper unit testing. It will not compile, it will not go anywhere else, it'll just be kicked back until they do that. And, and that's uh, also reviewed as part of a pull request. So if they try to sneak someone by or an approver says, well, let's just get it in, the, uh, the uh, CI CD will kick it back out. Move code, not data, right? So like most shops, our code should be much smaller than our data. And we had a bad habit in our own monolithic architecture where we were pushing data all over the place to get to the code, whether it was um, moving copies of large SQL databases or, or something like that. We we're getting away from that and we we're focused on our microservices coming to the data. Uh, and, and the data in the back end for us right now will, will be uh, HDFS file systems that, that hold uh, multi-year, up to a decade's worth of data. So we wanna make sure anything can fail. We've set this up from the beginning that no developer should assume high availability of, of any part of the architecture, whether that's hardware or including the allocation of, of resources within OpenShift, that things will fail and they need to be able to handle that. Documentation is important and that is also part of a pull request. You have to have proper documentation in your readme markdown. Um, comments in the code are reviewed as part of pull requests as well as making sure that we have all the details behind that in our, in our wiki for other developers who may be hired in the future who may join an Agile team to be able to follow it. And monitoring, right? That's pretty, pretty straightforward. So as we get to our adoption of OpenShift, we started the journey back in June of 2016. And in that, we said we wanna look at platform as a service. It was important to us to make sure we weren't locked into a cloud vendor. We wanted to use their IS functionalities, but we wanted to be able to have flexibility so that today it may be AWS, tomorrow it could be GCE, and five years from now it could be something that none of us even know about. So as we kicked off our POC, we started looking first at the different opportunities in the PaaS layer, and uh, we, we decided to also start off in conjunction with that some microservices POC so that we had some technology running on each of those. By, the end, by August, we decided to use Origin. It, was, uh, it worked out really well. It passed all the tests uh, far and beyond anything else that we had looked at, and then we narrowed it down to a total of three we used in the POC. Shortly after that, our sprint started for a minimum viable product in the middle of August, and we decided that that was going so well by mid-November that we wanted to be on OpenShift Enterprise. We started off with Origin because we wanted to understand everything before we made the investment and it went really well. Um, <laughs> through that, we also looked at the uh, EFK stack uh, that's provided in OpenShift because logging is a huge part in monitoring, so we deployed that. And we completed our MVP at the end of the year, uh, displayed it to the company, and it went really well. Uh, we were um, really, really able to strongly demonstrate the scale. I think with a uh, processing two years worth of trades, and, and we do massive volumes of trades, millions and millions per day, we were able to aggregate, I think, 800 million trades in a few hours with three pods. And as we scaled up and up, by the time we got the 50 pods, it was, it was almost linear. We were able to do the 800 million trades in 40 minutes. So that was pretty huge for us. Uh, shortly after that, we worked with Red Hat Consulting in March, and we did an uh, OpenShift container platform installation as part of our, our enterprise. And we just recently installed Jenkins and Cloud Forms to help supplement the work that we're doing. So, so uh, as we talk about our deployment strategy, um, today we're using the Atlassian stack. 
uh, since we have Jenkins, we're in the process of, of replacing it, but a developer will check their code into Git when they've uh, had an approved pull request. We will do a build and unit test. That build for us uh, consists of taking our code from our Git repo, uh, compiling anything that's necessary. Uh, we also include inside there a template for OpenShift. So that template contains everything that a developer needs in order to uh, deploy their application in their namespace, and we build our Docker container on the fly that gets included with the deployment and push that up to our OpenShift cluster, and the release gets deployed. And that gives the developers full flexibility, so if they're working on a release branch, they can make some changes to their namespace, they're able to work in dev and have multiple either uh, features or bug fixes going on concurrently from, <coughs> from a code base. Sorry. <laughs> Before, before it uh, goes out in, into our dev environment. So this is just a little peek at what the uh, release would look like. Um, we've set it up so that right now they, they uh, can push a button or it can happen automatically, and then their code gets deployed via a API call into OpenShift. So in general, this is the, uh, the reference architecture that we're working with uh, from the Point 72 network. Uh, should look pretty familiar to anyone who's done a deployment, but we have our HA proxy load balancer with three masters that, uh, that come inside um, our, our nodes. We've opted to specify nodes and use node selectors for deployments, so that as a developer is working in part of their sprint with our chapter meetings for the DevOps side, they'll talk to us ahead of time. I know uh, in this sprint I'm going to need some amount of compute resource. Uh, some of our applications uh, will allocate uh, dedicated CPU or memory, and, and that process will make sure that nodes get deployed, have the proper labels applied, and in their code, as part of their Git repository, they can specify a node selector. That, that gives us a, a, a real big advantage in controlling our cost in the cloud, so that we're only deploying to high-end servers that are doing a higher-end workload that may require more CPU or memory. If it's, um, if it's a general purpose UI component, it can go in the general pool and we'll deploy it there so that we, we keep our costs as low as we possibly can. So um, they say we, uh, they say we have a, a multi-tier strategy for HA. We also have a direct connect up to our cloud providers with an IPsec tunnel in between so that we, we have a high level of security and confidence there. Uh, for uh, multiple environments, we're leveraging router sharding so that we can have dev, QA, and UAT within the same cluster using different subdomains and make sure that uh, as developers are pushing through and the CICD kicks off that everything is organized and structured that we don't have any blending. We do keep production as a separate cluster so that something that may go awry here doesn't affect our SLA for production. Next. Oh, and I talked about the node selectors already. And we, um, and, and I talked about how we guarantee compute resources by leveraging those node selectors. So we do some monitoring reporting, um, and we're, we're getting through it. So some of our requirements, we wanted to be able to have a chargeback and show back, multiple cloud providers provisioning a view of our resources, both for the cloud and OpenShift. So CloudForm seemed to fit that pretty nicely for us. We have it running inside of OpenShift in its own namespace, and we have, it, have success with both Origin and the OCP platform. So we, we've had no problems there. Just as an example of one of our sandbox environments, we are able to get some high-level stats, and you can see in the top left, we have both our origin and OCP. We also um, leverage the EFK stack, Elasticsearch, Kibana, and FluentD pretty heavily. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had a UI for dashboards, we had separation of, of the data so that we could run fast queries, scale it quickly, but one thing that was really important to me is that I didn't want my monitoring and logging platform to be on the same system that I'm monitoring and logging. So we opted to separate the EFK stack and we use Secure Forwarder for FluentD and we send everything outside of that. So if there's a problem, and that problem is large enough that I can't get into OpenShift and we haven't seen that, but if there were, then I, I have access to the data right away. The other advantage for us that, that, that brought us is that we can then run the latest releases and anyone who's using the Elasticsearch stack knows that they have a very frequent release cycle and they, they uh, are providing a lot of features that we've been looking for. The, the last thing from our developers was the ability to leverage different plugins, either in Elasticsearch, FluentD, or Kibana. And we, we uh, faced the challenges that as the, the new container image that was coming from Red Hat and OpenShift would update and overwrite some of our customizations. So that, that proved out really well for us and gave us exactly what we were looking for. So this is an overview of what we have set up. So we have a FluentD daemon set, leverage the secure Florida to a FluentD server, 
that also is running our Kibana interface with Elasticsearch uh, 5.3. And then this little dashboard in the end is one that I contrived with a, a ton of errors, but just to show a dashboard in Kibana in terms of the number of, um, you know, what do we have? Uh, oh, some of our um, stats that were skipped, CPU failed errors, so we were messing around and taking things down to create a dashboard that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, it really doesn't show us very much. <laughs> um, uh, so Prometheus, which uh, was mentioned earlier, was also important to us in our stack. We looked around at some commercial products, and we, of course, open source first, and found that Prometheus met our needs quite well. It does a good job of scraping the data, gives us a nice uh, live feed for a RESTful API. As we get into Jenkins, we can pull metrics in from Jenkins as well, so we decided to, to do that. It's in a custom container that, that we created for OpenShift, and we don't expose Prometheus data to any of the users. We only give them access via Grafana. So you can see it's our container, and those are some of the container uh, information that we're scraping back from Prometheus. So Grafana, uh, I'll let you talk about a little bit about Grafana. You worked on that? Sure. Um, so Grafana, um, we had you know, similar requirements in regards to it needed to be open source. Uh, we needed it to handle multiple data feeds for different applications. Um, we needed it to have Active Directory integration. Uh, user access control uh, was actually fairly big, and Grafana handled it very nicely. Um, there's a bunch, you know, you create different organizations, um, different levels of access control, which was nice. Uh, the ability to export graphs and data, uh, and the ability to create custom views uh, and dashboards. Um, Grafana is as well uh, deployed in a custom container. Um, and for access to the data feeds and to keep Prometheus uh, inaccessible, we remo removed the Prometheus route uh, and used internal DNS name, um, the listed there. <laughs> and uh, in Grafana, we used uh, multiple data feeds and are able to control user access, uh, create custom dashboards, queries, and export data for analysis. Um, here are some examples, uh, different dashboards that we created. Um, as you can see, uh, we're not just using this for OpenShift specifically, uh, we can also use it for uh, our Hadoop cluster, um, as uh, well as you know managing the, the, the host metrics uh, physically, um, pretty much anything that we need, which uh, is why we chose Grafana. Uh, so troubleshooting, uh, we just wanted to share with you guys some of the troubleshoot, like some of the issues that we ran into, um, some of the troubleshooting steps that we uh, took. Uh, how we resolve them, um, and just a different, couple different scenarios, uh, which may be useful for some uh, if you guys run into it in the future. Um, let's see, we use node selectors as part of our deployments. Uh, we've had to change the cloud instance type to match the business workloads used by OpenShift. Uh, we found there are times where node labels uh, were no longer applied uh, after the instance type was changed. Um, this was, I believe, specifically when you're using origin, um, the resolution uh, for how we handled this. After some investigation, we found all we had to do was add the label back to the nodes. Um, some example uh, commands here. Do you want to? Oh, yeah, sure. So one of the key things uh, managing the team that I'm responsible for, of course, is cost. So we've made it a point to turn off our dev and POC environments through the process so that we, we, we would be able to save money, right? Because uh, through those, we're running on hourly instances. So as part of that, you know, this is just a, a simple thing where we, we wrote some jobs that would run through the Amazon or Google APIs and shut everything down on schedule, bring it up on schedule. It was flexible and adjustable. We didn't give the developers access to decide when, but we made sure that it was, it was consistent and we did change it over time as our development teams became more global, spreading everywhere from the Ukraine all the way through India. So um, oftentimes, sometimes, let's just say oftentimes, sometimes we'll see a cluster not ready if we're running a uh, OC get nodes. And this can have any number of reasons. Typically we found the best thing to do is to go through and just start doing some good old fashioned troubleshooting on the node if it's not ready. Uh, sometimes we find it may not be open shift. It could be that you have a full file system. That's happened to us a couple times uh, if we were mounting something and, and people filled it up. Uh, so, so we just have to be careful about that. Um, oh, this did not translate well from, from the uh, PowerPoint. 
But at any rate, um, one of the, ex oh, it was supposed to fade the background, but in this example, if we are able to do a um, OC describe node, you can start to see that uh, on the top part, you're going to get some utilization levels for all the pods inside your node. So we also find that very useful in troubleshooting because if the node's busy because there's a heavy workload, which pod is causing it? What's, what's really driving the workload and the utilization? Which in turn, we can go back to the developer and say, hey, you just released this code and it's really messing things up. Please go take a look and we're, we're going to ask you to deploy a new build. So, so uh, that's pretty, pretty nice. And then of course on the bottom, if you haven't looked at that, you can get the events that have happened for that node for the, uh, for the, since the, since um, in this case, uh, for the last seven and 10 hours, it was first seen, but it's checking frequently every 10 seconds, it seems. So we, we leverage this pretty much. We're, we're command line junkies. The UI is great and our developers use it, but, but we, we do everything through the API and UI. So, um, so our routes, um, we, we have, uh, did some experimentation in our POC where we were taking routers in and out. One of the things we were looking for was to understand for production if we hit a certain level of requests and workload flowing through there for the applications we're running, how is the behavior, how do we extend our, 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 our um, available routers and the infrastructure nodes in order to make sure we can service requests? So during that process, we, we really found that this was self-inflicted, but the fact is that we didn't have wildcard DNS entries because we're not using an F5 load balancer in front of it for our routes. So going in and just paying attention to other parts of your infrastructure is really the point here. Don't assume everything could be isolated inside of OpenShift because there are upstream dependencies in your environment. As we went through, um, Sky DNS was important uh, to us, and, and Dan has done a lot of work with some customization there, so do you want to talk a little about that? Um, well, yeah, sure. I mean, basically it was the, um, we had to find a way uh, to assist our developers. They have multiple applications and uh, custom applications that need to communicate with each other, but they're not necessarily in the same project or namespace. Um, I mean, this was a pretty simple um, you know, fix and looking up in the documentation of how SkyDNS uh, by default functions in OpenShift. Um, but uh, uh, you know, using the, the uh, uh, different uh, names there, you know, with the service, the project, the namespace, you know, svc.cluster.local, uh, we could uh, have one developer hand that to another on a different team uh, to say, you know, you need to include this host name into your application uh, in order to connect uh, with this specific port. Um, and that, that just became very useful and that was something that took a little while to figure Oops, out. Yeah. And you can see uh, on, the, on the image, I know it might be hard to read, but this is one page of about six just in our development environment for all the different routes and, and services that we have running inside there. So as we got into the services, um, and this is another one you worked on, I'll yeah. let you take this. Okay. Um, so we found that applications will expose ports uh, uh, other than HTTP and HTTPS, uh, and our developers need uh, access to those ports. So that was one of the issues that we ran into at first that actually we were banging our heads on for a little while is um, like the port's open, but nobody can connect. <laughs> this is, this is kind of weird, but um, I mean, it was again fairly simple. Um, the uh, uh, load balancers don't uh, handle non-HTTP or HTTPS traffic. Uh, there is a solution for this, uh, node ports, um, which is also fairly simple to resolve. You can go into the service uh, template uh, or modify the YAML uh, right there in uh, the UI, uh, change the type uh, from um, cluster IP to uh, node port, and it will either automatically assign a node port or you can specify one yourself. The range by default is 30,000 to 32,000. Uh, we, in our um, CICD process, we have a uh, uh, port management. Um, one of our developers helped me out with this. <laughs> uh, but it will go through and select the next uh, open port in the list out of 32,000 um, and automatically assign it. And as you can see, uh, you can, like once the node port is assigned, it's assigned to all the nodes in your cluster, not just one. So it's kind of a reservation that no matter when uh, the pod is running on any one of your nodes, that port is specifically reserved for that pod uh, everywhere. Um, so they're, they're, that was something that uh, uh, we have utilized uh, a lot and has become really handy. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so sorry. Um, so node affinity, uh, that was something that uh, we also had an issue with uh, prior to 3.4. Um, and anti node, uh, excuse me, node anti affinity uh, was we wanted to ensure uh, specific applications and pods were running all on different nodes, right? In case one of the nodes goes down, we are 100% certain that this application is running on a different, uh, different node. Well, prior to if I can add to that too, is we were shutting things down every day and bringing it up as the cluster would come up. If a node came up and it was the selector matched, it would try, OpenShift would try to deploy everything there because it saw it first, then we would be able to go back and rebalance using this technique as well. Right, exactly, and so that, that was uh, an issue. 3.4 has uh, included the, the node anti-affinity, uh, which has solved our problem, but as you can see, one workaround that we used was uh, just multiple labels. It's a, a, a label, and it's like a secondary group label. Um, so you have your type, which is, in this case, uh, you know, arc messaging, and then a secondary group, uh, which was arc messaging-3. So the way that that, um, you know, in the example here, say we have uh, three pods that we want to ensure is running on our high compute nodes. Um, and they have to be evenly distributed. Uh, to do this, you have three or six nodes, specifically, and then you will have one, like they're, all the nodes are labeled with compute, and then you'll have your subgroup, two of the nodes are, you know, group one, group two, group three, and then you just ensure that your application is labeled appropriately to a specific group. So they are evenly distributed. Um, so one of the things that we, we also run into, which I'm sure everybody has, is troubleshooting networking issues. Uh, things that we don't want to put out there in any of our containers or pods are you know, tools that we don't need, ping and netcat, nmap, curl, et cetera, and we get a lot of requests for it. So we came up with some other techniques to use it, and one of them is a handy little uh, uh, device called devtcp. It allows us to open up a TCP connection to any host that resolves on any port that we want. So we use this very commonly for troubleshooting issues. We use it as a technique for monitoring things that may be going on in a container if we want it to have it self-monitor. But uh, as you see in the top left, just uh, three lines in a bash script and we're able to you know, exec the device. We're able to do an echo statement and feed in, in this case, a very simple HTTP request and we get the response back in there and then we can parse this response with our monitoring systems or, or other tools and very quickly and very easily use what's already provided to us without adding anything extra. So, so we, we make that a, a key part of our troubleshooting whenever we think we have network issues. Um, so sometimes we, we saw some uh, things with, with our Docker registry early on um, and really that just came to uh, us being fairly new with it and following some good practices about cleaning things up. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, a little ahead of my slide. Oh yeah, so we, yeah, we have multiple images and we wanted a private registry, so we do use Artifactory. All of our images uh, are sourced from Red Hat. We feed them into there and then we use that when we go through our CI CD process in order to make sure that we have an application that is, that is purpose built for, for what's being run. And then this is just a, um, a list of some of the images. Again, there's pages of them as our developers like to deploy early and often. Um, so some of the other, um, problems that we ran into, we actually run into this everywhere we run Docker, um, is that our networking team many years ago used uh, 172.0.0.16 as the network block, and yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it sounds like people have seen that, so we, we run into that, so we, we have a practice too that we make sure that we um, use, uh, what is it, 10.1.0.0.16 or whatever, we make sure we change our do Docker networking and that's helped us quite a bit because the first complaint you get is, how come I can't reach it? <laughs> so, so that was another area we, we kind of worked through. Um, and this is the other one where sometimes we would hold on to images and this will be really quick. You can see on the left, um, we have a bunch of images that would show up with no repository associated with them and we would just do a, a, a quick one-liner to, to clean those up right by, by uh, grabbing all the ones that have no, no uh, repository. They're orphaned from, from uh, some deployment or some build that failed or whatever, and we just like to keep that clean so that the LDM volume we dedicate to Docker doesn't fill up on us, because that, that gets pretty ugly too. All right, we're getting through it. You wanna talk about some persistent storage? Yeah, yeah, so uh, one of the issues, uh, we had a um, cluster, um, a messaging cluster, uh, uh, with three different nodes uh, spun up in OpenShift, and we have EBS as our uh, persistent volumes in the back end. 
Well, each disk was 500 gigs, um, and there's one presented to uh, each node or each pod. Um, well, they all filled up, and I was like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> like, the cluster's down, I have no more storage, and I have EBS volumes attached. Like, how am I supposed to, you know, work with OpenShift in expanding these volumes? Because EBS volumes are fairly simple to expand anyways, right? So you create a snapshot, and then you create a volume from that snapshot that's a larger size. Um, fairly simple. Well, then I was thinking, what about an OpenShift? Like, how do I get my pod to see this disk um, uh, and expand the, the, the file system? Like, is OpenShift going to handle this properly? Is it going to, like, recognize this, this new disk and, like, reformat it? Um, since I have uh, XFS specified in my physical volume, like, I just wasn't sure, so this took some, some testing and some hoping that nothing was going to happen. Um, but uh, so it turns out uh, what I could do was uh, expand the volumes, um, uh, the EBS volumes itself, and then attach, or I'm sorry, then actually go in and update the physical volume object in OpenShift itself, uh, which is just changing the volume ID and the size, uh, leaving everything else the same. Uh, actually spin up the pod. Uh, it's going to fail, uh, obviously, because it's still out of space. Um, but I can check and see where that pod uh, was currently, um, what node it's running on, log into that node, and then, simple enough, uh, the disk is mounted, and you can just do a XFS GrowFS and grow it on the fly. Um, so that worked out very well. <laughs> Your right. API. And my wording here, I think I messed it up a little <laughs> bit. But, uh, uh, so again, uh, in Origin specifically, uh, prior to 3.4, we were having issues with the AWS uh, uh, storage classes. Um, could not find, could not find uh, very much uh, in regards to the, our specific issue, other than it's really weird. So uh, basically what the issue was, uh, even with the zone specified, uh, whenever we would go to auto-provision an EBS volume, it would be created in a random zone, whether it be 1A, you know, 1B, 1C, 1D. I mean, it was completely random. Uh, therefore, if it's not in the same zone, it's not going to connect. Um, so to address the issue, uh, we created an API um, to kind of interface between OpenShift uh, as well as AWS. Um, so the API... Uh, has to, it does multiple things, uh, but this was specifically in regards to uh, uh, fixing this one specific issue. I just wanted to add a bunch of other stuff for fun. Um, but, uh, uh, and getting a token. That is another thing that I had to add for our developers, uh, assisting them with some uh, other issues they were having during uh, the CI CD process. But, uh, so the API would make a query to AWS to create the EBS volume which would in turn uh, return the volume ID. Uh, using that, uh, I was able to then have my API query the OpenShift API to create a physical volume object with the associated volume ID uh, size and name. Um, and this was something that we added into our CI CD process. Uh, uh, one of our developers for um, Atlassian uh, helped us out and um, uh, added that into their process uh, when a uh, persistent volume was required. Um, and now that this took quite a bit of time to, to put together, but uh, 3.4 has resolved that issue. So that's no longer needed. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's how we solve that. All right. So the last thing we'll cover on our troubleshooting was backups. So critical to everything, in addition to managing the Linux team and, and, and responsible for our cloud, I also own backups all the storage at the firm as well, so this is at the forefront of my mind. So we, we came up with a simple technique where we want to back up our certs and any of our keys. We want to step through and make sure that we hit etcd and we hit any of the namespaces and deployments that we have. So to get there right now, and all of this will run, it will uh, drop to a directory. We check that into Git every day, and it gives us the ability to be able to restore from any tag or version that we have inside of Git. So we will um, do our etcd CTL backup. We will log in. 
make sure we get a list of our projects and from the list of projects we export each step of the way as an OpenShift template and that template is what we bring inside of our, of our Git repo for backups. Our Git repos of course are backed up in our uh, enterprise backup system but it gives us a lot of flexibility uh, as we look to the horizon for next steps. We also want to be able to create multiple environments very quickly that are identical and if we can pull them out of here along with the Git repos for the applications, we uh, feel like we have a very good start on that. I think we're running long on time, so we did have a page, and we'll, we'll skip it for now, but um, of some of our best practices, and if somebody wants to talk to us later, we'll be more than happy to, to discuss some of that with you. Okay, excellent. So I, and I, I, we're very technical guys, we're not too big on the marketing stuff, so I hope you found some value, and thank you. <laughs>